Yeah, thank you everybody uh, for joining us today. Uh, it's exciting to be here. We're gonna look at the three characteristics and ac actions that are needed to fundraise your way out of a pandemic. Uh, and it's basically mindset, message, and method. I also, uh, Alex reminded me um, through his introduction, uh, if anybody is low in vision, I'm a white Jewish male in my early 60s, proud of that, and I'm wearing a blue checked shirt. I'm also really excited that um, we have not a super huge group today. We've got, uh, if, if you can see in the in the participants, we have about a uh, little over 20 people, which is actually really good because I'm, I'm gonna stop uh, throughout the presentation um, and uh, kind of ask for input and see what your experience has been uh, during the really challenging period for all of us of, of the pandemic over the last three years and, and what's going on for you now. So I'm, I'm excited for that. And I'm going to now just take a minute and um, find my slides, share my screen. Your um, uh, Alex, let me ask you if, if people want to comment or ask a question, should they do that in the chat or the Q&A? Um, they could do it in either place. Okay. So don't be shy if you have anything you wanna either just express or ask about or anything like that, um, feel free. Also, um, I believe, uh, Alex, if somebody puts it in the chat, do the other participants get to see it? Yes, they should be able to see it. Okay, so if you wanna just, uh, I encourage anybody who wants to introduce themselves and say, hey, this is who I am, this is where I work, uh, feel free to do that. I'm not gonna be able to look at it because I, I'm gonna be looking at my slides, but anybody else who wants to see uh, what's going on here, um, free to do that. And I promise you, uh, we will be finished by uh, 12 noon New York time and uh, you will have fun. Those are my promises. So here we go. All right, so you've come to the right place. Our conversation today is called How to Fundraise Your Way Out of a Pandemic. And this, my friends, is a quick reminder on what fundraising is about. Your goal is to take as big a pile of money as possible and get it into your nonprofit's bank account. That's what's going on on this slide. We've got a pile of money, it's going into the bank account, into the bank. Now, the paradox which is what really we're gonna talk about in different ways throughout this conversation is that if you focus on just getting the money, you'll definitely get some. But if you figure out how to really drill down on the best mindset methods and messages, you're gonna get much more money. And uh, along the way, you're going to have much stronger relationships with the people and organizations that give it to you. So I like to think about what we're gonna talk about today in, in the big picture terms of fundraising is how to turn your dream of a better future into reality. And that's particularly important no matter what your nonprofit does in today's world as we are, I don't know what the right word is, digging our way, rising our way, or you know, fundraising our way out of, out of a uh, thing that the entire world went through over the last three years uh, and was really um, a lot of hardship and a lot of tragedy for a lot of people. I wanna say that there, there's really two ways you can participate in this webinar. I'm sure you're familiar with both of them because uh, I'm sure you, you've, you've done one of the two probably in, in previous webinars is you can pay full attention. We have about 50 minutes left now, uh, or you can listen with one ear and check your emails. I honestly 
don't care, it's up to you. But if you stick with me, you're gonna have a different mindset at, at the end of this conversation. To start off, I wanted to just give you a little context for, for who I am and where I'm coming from. So I'm the founder of the Heller Fundraising Group. Uh, we've been around for almost 19 years now. Um, prior to that, I worked at uh, mostly large universities and, and some smaller colleges for about 15 years. And over the last 19 years, we've worked with a lot of nonprofits in the New York area, throughout the East Coast, and um, really around the country. Um, and here's our mission statement. We're a for-profit company, and at the same time, we do have a mission statement. We build abundance for our nonprofit clients through customized consulting and training for successful capital campaigns, insightful feasibility studies, and prosperous major gift programs. So on this page, there's a smattering of the um, logos of some of our clients. You'll probably recognize some of them. Uh, this is uh, part of our current team. There's about 25 of us. Uh, six of us are staff and uh, meaning employees and the rec rest are collaborating consultants. And what do we do? I said it a little bit in our mission statement, but just to be clear, uh, feasibility and planning studies, which often lead up to capital campaigns or sometimes help a nonprofit figure out what their next steps for fundraising are, we help fine tune and build up the capacity in a development office we help nonprofits who are not in campaigns build major donor and major gift programs. And just like today, we do a lot of training and coaching. Um, and we have some basic solutions. We can do prospect research for you. Uh, we can do quick audits of what's going on. We can do foundation grant writing. And we also uh, offer uh, a low fee subscription to donor search, which is a, uh, uh, wealth screening database that uh, we are able to offer that through our relationship with donor search. So um, I just wanted to make this offer to you before we get into the material. Uh, if you go to our website, hellerfundraisinggroup.com backslash tools, there's a handful of free tools you might enjoy uh, using and will help you with your fundraising skills. And um, anybody, uh, Anybody who's here today is more than welcome to email me personally with uh, your questions or comments and I'll, I'll do the best to answer or refer you to a member of our team. It's peter at hellerfundraisinggroup.com. Be happy to hear from you. So just as a reminder, you're in the right place. Today's webinar is called How to Fundraise Your Way Out of a Pandemic. And because there's a lot of concern about the economy, whether it's recession or not, we're going to talk about that and you know how do you fundraise into a recession as i said the three main concepts mindset method and message and we're going to get to all those one at a time right now i like to do things that have you know a, a kind of a symmetry to them so i picked three things with an m but i didn't just pick them because they have m's i picked them because they're really uh in my mind powerful kinds of concepts and um, you'll be able to decide for yourself. So our first concept is mindset. What am I talking about? I like to think of nonprofit leaders as dream builders. Anybody who started a nonprofit has turned a dream into a reality. You can look at almost any nonprofits, whether, whether it's been around hundreds of years, whether it's huge, um, like the Metropolitan Opera, or it's tiny, like a social service organization that's serving a, a few block radius in New York. Both of those organizations turned a dream into reality, and they also have ongoing struggles to keep those dreams happening and to build those dreams even stronger now and in the future. That's the mindset. It's really important when you're working in the nonprofit world, especially when you're trying to do fundraising, 
to look at whatever personal or organizational limiting beliefs you might have. And I like to look at it in terms of going from the world of no to the world of yes. What do I mean by that? It's like, think of anything important that's been achieved in this world. It's generally been done from a ground or a starting place of no. Like this hasn't happened before. Nobody's done that before. Um, how do we get there? Well, you have to push from that world of no to the world of yes. That's the work of any nonprofit that's making the world a better place in their own individual realm of, of the world. And I wanted to look at a few, there's so many examples. Here's a few examples of some people who pushed from the world of no to the world of yes. Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Malalia Yosefiza. I'm sorry, I'm messing up the pronunciation of her name, but I think most people know who she is. Those people all pushed from the world of no to the world of yes. And amazing things happened. So I'd like to take my first quick uh, interactive uh, pause here and find out from some of you, if you could share either in the chat or the Q&A, and Alex will read out what you've put there. What happened for you uh, with fundraising uh, during the pandemic? Got anybody who wants to share something? All right, looks like maybe- um, So Michael said no get togethers in person. Okay, that's that's super helpful. What about, and how did, how was fundraising affected? Was your fundraising, um, you know, did it drop down? Did it increase? What were the, there's some methods that you use to, to keep things going. Yeah, so Nicole mentioned um, our revenue actually boomed, but is now reversing. Yeah, I, I've <laughs> seen and heard about that happen. Yep. Uh, Phoebe says, we pivoted to specific programs and lost funding for the overall programming. And then Barry says things slowed down a bit, but thanks to Clubhouse, I was able to get on nonprofit groups to pull in donors. Amazing. So, uh, you know, I want to share, I, I wasn't, uh, oh, and I see, do we have a few more chats, uh, Alex? Yeah, so Yolanda, uh, says we switched to online events, which were not as large or successful as in person. And then Sherry says we stopped in-person live events. We did a few online live events that were very mediocre in results, or we went heavy on donor requests to the heavy hitters. Excellent. So uh, first, uh, I just want to really thank everybody who who spoke up. I really appreciate hearing about that. Um, and what I hear in common through all those things is that you didn't freeze. And to me, like, first of all, whatever happened to anybody during the pandemic, whether they froze or not, you can't blame anybody. It was like, I mean, you know, we're still dealing with the repercussions of it, of course. It was a really stressful time. For, for months, none of us knew what was going on. We were barely leaving our houses. Any reaction you had, it's just the reaction you had. And when you realize how important your mission is, regardless of whether it had anything to do with the front line of, of COVID or not, and you can take steps to keep working on that mission, it's a really powerful thing. And I hear the creativity in, in people's responses there. Um, and uh, 
what I, uh, this next slide with the ostrich with its head in the sand, you know, this is what we want to not do in times of crisis. And unfortunately, some of our clients did this and, and you know, we did our best to kind of coax them out of it, but the majority of them found ways to keep going in, in small and different ways and sometimes, sometimes in even bigger ways. Um, I think that emerging from the pandemic, one of the most important things to me is just to remember, and this has to do with the, that whole mindset and limiting belief thing, remember how important the work you're doing is and how you are building stronger community for the future. And that community could be, again, it could be a social service organization in a certain neighborhood. It could be um, an arts organization. It could be a theater. It's however you define community. If you're gonna do the hard work of running a nonprofit and the hard work of fundraising, you've really got to believe that the, that what you're doing is important. Otherwise it, it's, it's exhausting and it's, I mean, it's stressful even if you do believe often, but you, you have to believe that, that's my conviction there. So the other thing about limiting beliefs is if we wanna build a better future, it's important to recognize that the future is not just equal to more of the present. There can be something wow and exciting in the future. And uh, I had a couple um, uh, things I wanted to suggest is that your mindset impacts your future. I, I struggle with this every day. It's like, you know, trying to wake up, get everything organized. I run a business. You saw some of the things we do. It's like, how do I stay in a positive mindset and help our clients build our business, support my team? Um, and a lot of that has to do with focusing on what will your personal future look like and what will your nonprofit's future look like. And the more you can spend some time every day thinking about positive things for that future, the, the, the lighter it's going to make you in terms of doing the work, it's also going to help manifest it in a kind of way I can't quite explain. So I just wanted to share two photos before we move to uh, uh, concept number two. So this is a, um, a synagogue in Falls Church, Virginia that we worked with for a number of years on a, on a large capital campaign. Uh, this is the, the, the woman there is the head rabbi. This is an outdoor um, service they were holding with music. And um, their, for their event, they tapped into this. Uh, you can see there's everybody's wearing a T-shirt. The T-shirt says the future is wow. They tapped into this concept of like, let's make a really positive future for our community and for Judaism. And let's let's go deep with that. Um, and then here's a um, child care center in uh, Austin, New York, that we worked with, helped them uh, raise the money to, to build their new amazing uh, facility. And uh, here's all the kids with the I am the future shirt and they were doing some kind of dance. Uh, before we move on to the next uh, concept, I wanted to share this with you. This is like crazy important. So if you were not listening to anything else, please listen to this. This, this has a lot to do with limiting beliefs and mindset. So, a lot of you are probably familiar with Giving USA, it's an organization uh, at the University of uh, Indiana University that um, publishes giving data every year for philanthropic money given out in the United States. So these are the dollar totals from all sources, uh, not including government, but uh, individuals, foundations, corporations, and uh, bequests. Um, totals that were given uh, the years 2007 to 2013. So there was the, um, uh, the what's called the Great Recession happened in 2008. And then the years uh, kind of before and during the pandemic. So 
on the left, you'll see that these are billions of dollars. So in 2007, $311 billion were given away in the United States. That's a lot of money. It then dipped down below that for four years because of the recession. And then in uh, 2012, it, it, it started to go up again. It actually was higher than 2007. Pandemic was different for a variety of reasons. The, the stock market did really well, et cetera. So the giving did not, uh, it went down uh, 2019 actually uh, a little bit prior to the pandemic, but then it, it went up. So the most important thing I want you to take away from this, particularly on the left-hand column that has to do with recession or economic problems is that 2009 went down to $274 billion, right? So that, that was a drop of like 30 something billion from uh, 2007. That's a lot of money, but, and there was a recession and people were struggling, nonprofits were struggling, families were struggling, businesses were struggling. But in 2009, when it was at its lowest, it wasn't at zero. Zero would be no money given away. There was till, still $274 billion given away. And my point is that the nonprofits who got more of that money were the ones who had a positive mindset and the ones who took action and went out and kept talking to their various types of donors. That's what you need to do in good times or bad times. That's really important for mindset. So um, I'm just gonna pause Alex to see if there might be any questions or, or comments and then we'll move on to message. Yeah, so we have a question from David Fisher and David asked, the world has such great need how do we convince folks that our need is the one that they should give to? Oh, that's a fabulous question. So I was just talking about this yesterday. I believe that every nonprofit, like most of us human beings, have an internal kind of conversation with themselves of, the things that they're not good at. So I, you know, I don't know about you, David, or, or others. You know, we have our, I have my own like internal voices of like, oh, I could be better at this, or I could be better at that. Nonprofits do the same thing. So for instance, um, we've worked with a lot of organizations that are not direct service providers, but rather um, like a advocacy organization for children or an organization that helps virtually all the off-Broadway theaters in New York City, but itself doesn't produce theater. And they often feel that, oh, we're not the, you know, the big shiny, we're not the save the children, we're not the big um, theater production company, we're, you know, people won't be interested in us. But It's really important to examine and recognize the beliefs that the nonprofit has. Um, and frankly, when I worked at Columbia University, I mean, it's kind of silly, but our, <laughs> like our kind of internal voice, which was like people said all the time was, you know, it's a billion, multi-billion dollar institution. And people were going around being like, oh, we're not Harvard. You know, we're not, I mean, Harvard's much wealthier than Columbia, but you know, it's like, so what? <laughs> um, so my point is that it's really, it, you can't, just like you can't worry about the economy going down, although I'm not saying, don't pretend it's not happening. Don't be aware of that. And you need to keep giving your message. It's the same thing, like, don't worry about what everybody else is doing. They're doing the best they can to make the world a better place in their way. And you just need to build your relationships with the people who are gonna care about you. And it has to do with both relationship building and it has to do 
with showing that you're making a difference. So that's a long answer, but I hope it helps. Um, so Alex, I'm gonna go now to, uh, to concept two and uh, if other people have questions, uh, feel free to, to type them into the chat and um, we'll, we'll get to them. So concept two for how to way, fundraise your way out of pandemic is your message. So I actually um, wanted to ask people if, if a few people could just share um, what sort of messaging you were using during the pandemic. You can share through the chat. Um, and I know um, somebody said earlier that, that their fundraising has actually gone down now. And I've, I've read a lot about this. I think there was an uptake, you know, people really gave a lot during the pandemic. There are challenges now where, where sort of lower level donors are not, are, are not giving as much, although there's a lot of mega gifts out there. Um, you know, these are really, these are real things to pay attention to. Um, so I don't see anybody, uh, Alex, I don't think we have anybody commenting on this. So I'll just say one or two things and then we'll keep going. I hope, uh, hope people have not fallen asleep. Uh, do we have a comment? Well, we have a question from Barry. Um, so Barry asked, how often should you send out messaging to donors? How often? Yes. Yeah, so there, you know, that's a really interesting question, Barry. So there, there's, I, I don't think I can give you a pat, like one size fits all answer. I will say that you, you know, you have to, depending on how you're sending your message out, um, email is still a really big thing. A lot of people are using social media, of course. Um, it depends on sort of what you're seeing as a response. Like if you're sending, like a daily email and tons of people are unsubscribing from your list or, you know, or not clicking through it, eh, maybe it's not the best, you know, maybe it's once a week, maybe it's once every two weeks. The important thing though, is that if you have something, you want to make sure you have something important to say and that if you do, I wouldn't be shy about sharing that message. And do we have another uh, comment or question, Alex? Uh, well, Barry wants to clarify in a month. Oh, in a month? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I again, it's. I think my answer sort of applies to that. I, I would play around, um, see what you get, um, what kind of responses you get. Are people engaging? with your messages. Uh, you know, at my company, we send out an email once a week and we have something for people to click on. We test the click rates and, you know, what do we, what do we have to share that's going to be more interesting? Um, you generally, like with fundraising, you know, the concept is like, if you're going to be sending emails, you don't want to ask for money every single time. You like calls to action and information about your organization. And then, you know, once a month or something you ask for for, uh, for a gift. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just gonna uh, say one or two things about messaging during the pandemic and then, and then keep going with this concept here. Um, you know, the same, something similar happened for me personally, uh, working, uh, during 9-11 in New York City. I, I was still at Columbia University at, at that time. And, you know, you don't put your head in the sand like that ostrich. What you do if you wanna be an effective message communicator is you stay close with the people in your community. And it's probably not the exact, like, the first thing you want to do is make sure people are safe and are being taken care of and check in with them. And then you want to talk about the important work you're doing 
and and ask for money and it's kind of i mean it i'll just give another quick example um sometimes uh if you're doing a major donor program and you have a conversation with a wealthy individual they might have the good fortune of having enough resources that they can you know pay the full fare for their three kids to go to college that's a, that's an extraordinary circumstance but like if all three of their kids are in college at the moment you're talking to them they're probably paying a ton of money and it might not be the exact right moment to ask them for a large donation however hopefully over the four or six years that that's happening you're not going to you're not going to be like okay you know i'll talk to you again in six years when your kids are out of college and you have money no you want to keep that conversation going because they're important to you and you hope you're important to them and you're recognizing that we're not going to ask you for money now it's that same thing like when there's a crisis in the world or in your community you don't stop talking to those people but the conversation is somewhat different so how are mindset and message connected? I'm just gonna read this slide out here. Uh, we've just discussed how important a positive future mindset is to break through limited beliefs and to get your, to your powerful future. The same thing is true for your message. It must describe a positive and powerful future. Understanding this is revolutionary, but that's not enough. Your message must describe a positive and powerful future. Be focused on the community you serve. They're the hero of your story, not you. I'll get to that uh, in a minute. Um, not be focused on your nonprofit's future. Demonstrate big roadblocks to that future. Describe programmatically how your nonprofit will make that future possible by removing the roadblocks, include how important money will be to this work. Now, if you wanted to take a screenshot of just one slide during this presentation, you might do this one because this is basically the um, outline for a really positive case for support for almost any nonprofit. Um, and I would argue that it's fairly different from what most people do when they're writing their case. And we use cases all the time in capital campaigns, but they're vital just so you know how to talk about your organization uh, on the phone, on Zoom, through an email, through social media, whatever. And the main point that I want to make here is, and I can't emphasize this enough, is like, what is this positive future for your community. You have to make sure that you're not talking about the positive future of your nonprofit. Of course, you want a positive future for your nonprofit, but you only exist to serve your community, whatever your community is. You have to remember that, that you're not as important as the community. If you can tell that story about your community's future, it's, it's golden. So I wanted to just share um, uh, one or two uh, messages that we put together in, in actual case for support for uh, our clients. This is uh, that same organization that had the kids with the orange t-shirts. Uh, this is the Ostling Children's Center. Uh, it was a I think $19 million campaign for their new home. So this is a, a young girl looking out an imaginary window over the Hudson River where the new building which was not yet built but would would be built and would would have this actual amazing view and we named the campaign our children our future and then when you open up the brochure you see a vision you know first of all there's more photos but there's a vision for every child deserving a chance to blossom and a little bit of information on the right about the Austin Children's Center. You get to the next page and it says, it, I don't know if you can read it, but it says, imagine a society that focuses its best resources on its children. And it describes that more 
And then it talks about a risky future because they're the problems and, and a better solution. Now, just to go back here, you know, if you count the cover as page one, then you got page two, page three, page four, page five. We've got five pages of a brochure. We haven't talked about money yet. We haven't barely talked about the Austin Children's Center itself. It's about children and the future. Yes, we helped them raise over $17 million, but you got to get people excited by the message of a stronger future. So, and that, that's what uh, happened here. And then here's one, uh, just a quick example of what not to do. Um, I love sharing this just because it's so awful. Um, and uh, this is a, another school. This, uh, we didn't work on this one. This was a sample that was given to us by the school. Um, I got rid of their name just to protect the innocent. This is the Centennial Campaign. So first of all, almost no color here, right? It's like gray blue. The Centennial Campaign is one of the most boring names I've ever heard. It's a school and there's not a child in sight. Then you get to the next page and there's a table of contents. I don't personally need a table of contents when I wanna get inspired. And then, oh wait, lo and behold, there are two kids, we see their backs. Could we maybe see their faces? Um, and then finally, you get to the introduction, it's page three, and, and it's literally boilerplate. I promise you, like I know who did this, so I know it kind of, it was boilerplate. There are moments in an institution's history that define its very existence. It's like I'm a, uh, one of those, um, you know, voiceover guys who, you know, for a blockbuster movie. So this is what not to do. This is uninspiring. Uh, I now, uh, we're going to talk about our last concept, which is method. And I wanted to see, Alex, if there's any uh, additional comments or questions. And anybody who hasn't typed one in, please feel free. If you've got something, just share something that's going on for you or any questions you have. Yeah, so Denise put in the chat, we provide residential services. So the message was that we are still here serving the most vulnerable among us and the needs persist and are greater than ever. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's great. It's reminding people that that you're still there, that that the vulnerable still need help. Um, yeah, I'm with you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I just uh, before we get to method, I, I wanted to share one more thing about kind of message that message and mindset together. Um, in my company with our staff and also when we do uh we do some uh monthly uh groups for our clients of about fundraising and we always start with asking people uh whether it's my team or or the clients who come to this uh zoom session we ask them to share a success or brag about something that went well and we remind people that we don't care how you define success. Success could be literally, I got out of bed this morning and I was able to make it to my desk. Or it could be, I asked somebody for a million dollars today. I honestly don't care. But the point is that we tend to move towards the next problem as people and not always remember the successes that we've done. And it's it's really good for mindset to spend a few minutes, not only alone, but as a group, just like acknowledging and even sometimes bragging about the things that went well. Try it out. Let me know what happens. So for our, our third and final concept, we have method. So reminder, these are how to fundraise your way out of a pandemic. Here's method. Okay, so no matter what, to fundraise, you have to do outreach to donors. Fundraising requires outreach to donors. There's no way around it. Those donors can be individuals. 
They can be foundations. They can be corporations. They can be government. Um, regardless, you have to take action in the world and engage with them. At the Heller Fundraising Group, we believe almost every nonprofit is under connecting and under asking of wealthy individual donors. Those people exist in the world. They have a lot of resources to give and they have a lot of interest in helping to make the world a better place. Um, it's just kind of one of the realities out there and that, that money and those relationships are available. So why not go for it? Um, but that's not, you know, there's a lot of different types of outreach. So let's look at, at some of the different things that you can do for outreach. You've got one-on-one -on -one outreach versus an email that goes to a thousand people. Either way, there's a method of communication. And during the pandemic, new ways to communicate and raise money became kind of obvious almost like so quickly. People, uh, even on, on the Zoom, people mentioned having uh, events over Zoom. People raised money and had galas over Zoom. It's important for you now, I mean, we're all having, or most of us are having many more in-person uh, meetings. Um, and virtual one-on-one -on -one meetings and virtual group meetings are still an option. I was just this weekend, I participated at a, uh, at a three-day training where they had 2,000 people on Zoom. It, it was quite astounding. Um, so the point here is you need to decide the best communication modality and technique for each donor and type of interaction. What works for a one-on-one -on -one communication and worked during the pandemic may not be exactly the right thing now. Um, I would have never ever in a million years suggested that somebody solicit a major gift over Zoom before the pandemic. And then what happened? People were doing a lot of it and they were doing it successfully. I now think you can do it still. And it's really important not to forget that human beings need human interaction. So don't make Zoom your default if you can go and meet with somebody. It's really important. So I'd like to ask, uh, this is the main last sharing. I, I'd love to ask um, some things you did to engage with donors, whether it was the type of emails you sent or uh, virtual meetings or whatever. What, some Share some that you're proud of over the last few years. Alex, do we have uh, anything? Uh, so far, nothing. Okay. All right. I hope hope I've still got a few of you still paying attention, pouring everything into this. I know there's some of you out there. Let's get a share about something you did over the last few years in terms of reaching out to donors that you're proud of. Help out a poor webinar presenter. So <clears throat> Michael Goldstein said that they hired a development officer. Jessica Burke um, mentions that this one is hard because we did some sweatshirts. We are a brand new organization. So it was their first time doing something like that. Great. So yeah. Um, yeah, there was a, actually, I don't know if any of you had this experience, but I mean, we had clients as a as a company. We had clients. We ran campaigns and feasibility studies for them and other things. We never met them in person. At one point, we were like, "Hey, we can come meet you." They're like, "Nah, not really needed." <laughs> so, um, and then you know, to to meet fundraising professionals who had never yet met their bosses in person or been to an office at the early times of the pandemic was was astounding. And do we have another uh, another comment? 
Yes, so this one is from Nicole. Nicole says we are a mentoring organization and we're able to create small virtual mentoring sessions for donors to interact with our clients so they stayed close to the mission and when we couldn't be in person. And oh, then Yolanda that. says, yeah. Yolanda says met one-on-one -on -one with donors who were comfortable meeting in person. We hired a donor relations manager to assist with engaging new folks and continuing to engage donors we already had. Um, Yolanda also mentions that they made a lot of connections just to check in on donors and see how they were doing. Um, Denise says, we did the lawn sign showing support for our central workers and sold them online. Katie says, especially at the beginning of COVID, we really ramped up on phone calls to current donors. A lot of our donors are elderly and we're stuck at home with the rest of us. It helped us deepen relationships and help keep them engaged. Um, David says, I am proud that we send a quarterly newsletter to all of our donors, highlighting a story about one of our children and highlight and highlights of activities going on with our mission. And that is it. Thank you, everybody. What a smart group of people. I, I mean, you folks did really great things over, over those uh, challenging years. And I, I, there was one comment about uh, uh, hiring a donor relations person. You know, I don't think I've met an organization that has enough donor relations and stewardship. It's a really challenging thing to continue to focus on. It's, it's often under-resourced, but you know, the more you can put systems in place to steward and thank and you know, build ongoing relationships with your donors at, at all levels, um, the better off, not only are you gonna continue raising money, but it's, it's the right thing to do because you're thanking them for their generosity and you're building that community of, you know, you're literally building a future with them for a better future for your community. And they're part of that. Uh, so let's just, we have a, a few more minutes. Let's just go through the most important things about method uh, uh, from my point of view. Uh, don't forget that people will always be people. Building relationships is the core concept of all fundraising. Um, you know, there's nothing in my presentation today about AI or chat GPT, but regardless of the technology out there, whether it's Zoom or AI or email or, you know, whatever, we need to keep those relationships going. So don't let technology dis solutions distract you from this core concept. Technology is a great tool. Don't let it become your master. Oh, we could just like never see anybody again and just do everything on Zoom. Don't get lazy. For your top donors of all types, you should still pick up the phone, schedule a real meeting, et cetera. It's amazing. Like I actually call people sometimes still, <laughs> not just text. So there are some inherent building blocks for your fundraising method that I believe will not change. For instance, in addition to mindset and message, you must have a dollar goal, a prospect list, staff and our volunteers doing fundraising. For today, let's just look at one of these. Your prospects. Okay, obviously a key part of fundraising. Without prospects, you don't really have much fundraising. We wanna know if we have enough prospects. How do I evaluate them? Do we, can we do a well screening, rating sessions, donor data? We do a lot of that work with our clients. Um, where can I get more prospects? If you uh, download those free tools I, on our website that I mentioned uh, earlier, there's a um, tool called Natural Networks, which helps you conceive of how to build those natural networks. Um, I just wanted to touch on one of our favorite tools, which many of you are probably familiar with, which is the gift table which really helps define how many prospects you need. So 
This is a table for a $5 million goal. The same thing is really true if it's a $500,000 goal or a $50 million goal. It's just the numbers changing a bit. We love to see three tiers, one leadership gifts, major gifts, and then community gifts. And depending on the dollar goal, the dollar amounts in each level are gonna change. Regardless, we like to see at least 70%, which in this case is $3.5 million in that top tier. And that comes from a small handful of donors. In this case, eight gifts are gonna make up 70% of your goal. You don't have to do it that way. You can put more of those gifts down below. Uh, we just find that if you can identify donors who can give at those levels, you're gonna do the organization and your community a favor, and it's, it's often possible. In terms of prospects, if you look at the middle column, you'll see that in terms of major uh, gifts and leadership gifts, we do a three to one ratio. So once you've established the dollar amounts of the gifts that you hope will come in, how many gifts at each level you need to get to that goal, you can then do a multiple of three to determine how many prospects you need at each level. For community gifts, we tend to think it's a two to one ratio. And in this case, to reach the $5 million goal for the gifts at $5,000 plus, you need 184 prospects. Now, if you have a database of 50 donors, it's obvious that you need to find more prospects. If you have a database of a thousand donors, the trick is then, do I have prospects who, if they wanted to, which is always a key question, if they wanted to, would make gifts at these various levels, would have the financial capability to do it. That's where the work then comes in, whether this is an annual, effort, whether it's a multi-year fundraising effort, whether it's a capital campaign or whatever, this table is a really useful tool to figure out uh, what you need to do. Um, I'm actually going to not go over the natural networks here. Uh, but you can download that on our website, but basically this is where these are the, you know, types of um, places you can look for, net, for a network to build your prospect base, your donors, your board members, advisory board, other people connected to your mission, business associates, friends and neighbors, um, or rich relatives. Uh, and um, that I'm, it's kind of a joke, but it's also true. Um, we take the prospects and then organize them into a spreadsheet that is um, defined by a next step date so that you know how much activity you can do within a given month and you know who to focus on first. This is, uh, this is also in those uh, free tools I mentioned along with instructions uh, to handle. This is a really powerful, it's a simple spreadsheet. We usually do it on Google, uh, Google, Google Sheets and share it with our clients and then use it as our weekly conversation to move people through the, the, uh, the donor process. You can put both foundations and individuals and corporations here. It's you know, whatever, whatever you like. Uh, and then just finally, because we're, we're just at about uh, 12 noon New York time, and I promise to finish up on time, I want to suggest that everybody take a moment and think about this phrase. I am the fundraiser who and then something powerful. I am the fundraiser who's gonna go back to my work now and identify 10 donors who I can reach out to this week. I am the fundraiser who made it through the pandemic and helped our organization survive. I'd like to encourage everybody, and thank you for sticking with me through this hour, everybody to just type in the chat and I am the fundraiser who, as a means of of inspiring us all 
and closing out our session today. And by the way, if you're in need of a fundraising consultant, there's an important question. What should I look for in a fundraising consultant? We think the answer is obvious. It's the Heller Fundraising Group. Please feel free to reach out. And if you want to be in touch with us, uh, here are some ways to do that. And if you um, want to scan that QR code, uh, we would love it if you left us a review. And uh, Alex, over to you. I see maybe we have one. I'm the fundraiser who maybe have a few final comments. Let's wrap it up. Yeah, so we have one from Sherry. Sherry says, I'm the fundraiser who did not give up. Thank you, Sherry. Keep up the good work. And uh, uh, Michael says, believes my goal of helping foster kids is important. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. And uh, were there any other uh, comments or questions that uh, we wanted to address there, Alex? Um, no. So looks like the last two, I'll read them. So Lauren says, I'm the fundraiser who will seek to foster relationships and see potential donors in every interaction, in person and virtually. Oh, go on. And then Yolanda says, I'm a fundraiser who is not afraid to ask for what her agency needs. I love those. Thank you all. Uh, all, all right. right. Oh, what looks like we have one more. Um, so it's a question from David, which I will address in my closing statement. So I hope you'll all <clears throat> join me in saying a big thank you to Peter for today's presentation. As a reminder, please fill out the survey that will be coming to your email if you'd like to receive an electronic copy of today's session materials. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Nonprofit New York if you have any questions. Thank you again to Peter and a big thanks to all of you for joining us today.